Welcome to the IEA podcast. My name is Matthew Ash. I'm the head of public policy here at the IEA. Each week, this podcast asks a tantalizing policy question to a top political and economic thinker. Today's question, is the energy market broken? This week, Labor opposition leader Keir Starmer announced a plan to freeze energy prices among concerns that they could reach £4,000 a month on average for households by January. Meanwhile, others have called for energy suppliers to be nationalised. To discuss the state of the energy market, I'm very excited to be joined by Sir Dieter Helm, Professor of Economic Policy at the University of Oxford and Fellow in Economics at New College. He's the author of the government's independent review into the cost of energy from 2017 and has spent decades writing about energy policy and advising governments and companies. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. So I just want to start getting back to the basics, since I think a lot of terms and ideas are thrown around often in the debate about the energy market. How does it more or less function? What, what is what is a supply? What is their role? What are the role of the wholesalers? How do we get energy to me as a consumer? Well, in the market structure we have at the moment, which is very 20th century, uh, at the core of this market is a wholesale market, uh, which matches marginal costs, marginal benefits together to uh, create a merit order and schedule what were historically overwhelmingly fossil fuel plants. Now, having uh, a market at the core then has a series of participants around it. And again, with very much a 20th century model in mind, uh, the energy market is divided between those who uh, run the main transmission, like National Grid and <coughs> Scottish Power and SC in Scotland, uh, the distribution companies that run the wires that go to your houses, um, and uh, then there are generators who generate the electricity to sell into the market, and then there are suppliers. And suppliers are the people who are supposed to buy electricity on your behalf and then sell it to you and collect uh, money from you for that energy, plus all the other social levies and costs that have been piled onto the system. So those are the component parts that we've inherited, and they fit with a marginal cost driven wholesale market structure, uh, which uh, developed in the 20th century. So I'm just getting to some of the issues with that particular structure, but uh, the perception obviously is that, well, this is a, a market that is is failing, that hasn't been properly operated. I think in many ways that's probably true, but I, I don't think it's exactly a free market. I mean, you, you wrote in your 2017 review that the scale of multiple inventions in the electricity market is now so great that few, if any, could even list them all and their interactions are poorly understood. How, what, what are those interventions and, and what are some of the major ones and the impacts that they're having on the market? Well, the interventions are uh, indeed so dense and complicated uh, that I doubt anyone could even keep up with the consultation consultations per day or per week uh, that come out about them. And they've been grafted onto uh, the market to try and uh, put sticky plasters on each and every problem that comes up. So this market was never developed for net zero and renewables, for example. And uh, a big, big change in the structure of the market was the support that governments gave and continue to give for renewables like wind and solar and uh, going forward, uh, nuclear and CCS and so on. Uh, and the problem uh, for the market structure is that most of this stuff is uneconomic or uncompetitive against the conventional fuels. So what happened, uh, and this is very much uh, in the last decade or so under Ed Miliband and actually uh, advised by uh, Jonathan Brayley, our current uh, Ofgem chief executive, uh, the government became the central buyer which is kind of a complete vault fast from the idea that you know generators would generate and suppliers would shop around for the best deal. What happened was that the government uh, became the buyer of all this uh, renewable stuff and then passed the costs on to you and me as customers about which there can be no competition at all. Okay, you just have to pay for the nuclear, you have to pay for the wind, you have to pay for the solar. There's no exemption from that. Uh, and um, in addition, 
as that problem became manifest, the government began to realize, governments began to realize that there was a potential security supply problem. They didn't really understand it, but they invented a capacity market to uh, buy capacity uh, to ensure that the lights would stay on. And again, that's a central buyer function. So the government became the purchaser to pass the stuff on to you and me. Now, all around that, huge complexities were added, and then government added all sorts of objectives it wanted to put on social issues, energy efficiency, uh, smart meters, and so on, many of which have been very badly delivered. But they're all about government. And I like to describe the system as the moment uh, at the moment as pretty much like the CGB we left behind. Uh, and actually, it's uh, small differences between uh, the CGB and this system that count. The radically divergent uh, model is the model that we had at privatization. It's all over, finished and done, and it's been buried in a heap of net zero and security supply concerns. Do you think there's an argument that in the initial years before the government started intervening, that that was a relatively well-functioning market? And then what we've subsequently seen is the government's come in, they've tried to pick winners, obviously losers are particularly good at, at picking government. Um, we've got all sorts of subsidies for um, different um, renewable energy projects, some of which might be justified on environmental grounds, um, but perhaps in a more neutral way. And then there's all, all associated additional costs to consumers um, that come from, from managing uh, the renewable energy in the grid, uh, the explicit obligations and explicit subsidies. We're now paying a small fortune to some of the um, uh, historic renewable energy suppliers because they get paid at the current market rate, which is set by the very high price of gas. You know, all these different things that have intervened um, and caused subsequent problems and push up prices come as a result of not um, intervening in a smart way to do net zero uh, and instead um, going into all sorts of different market interventions that then ends up piling problems on top of each other. Well, I'd never want to defend the current shambles. And it's uh, possible, and I'm sure we'll come on to discuss, how to make what we've got much more uh, efficient and to target competition in a very uh, important and efficiency enhancing way. So put aside the mess, the shambles we have at the moment. Uh, I think it's very easy to look at what we've got and think, oh, well, it was all so much better in the 1990s and the first part of the um, uh, first decade of the century. Well, it wasn't. Okay? And it, one of the reasons why interventions took place was because the privatized structure did not deliver what it was supposed to, what was on the tin. So there's all sorts of market abuse, et cetera, which brought the competition authorities into the game. But the fundamentals of the 1990s were low investment. It was about sweating the assets, stripping out the labor costs, which had come from a pre-digital and pre-computer world in the state sector, and you know, running the power stations efficiently, making the existing assets, sweating them, work better. What it was not much good at was the medium and long-term concerns and the investment itself. So, for example, a big change in the 1990s was to tear up all the long-term take or pay gas contracts, to argue that everything could be done on spot markets and indeed encourage the whole of the European Union to go down that route. Well, if only we had some background contracts to make markets work. You know, markets aren't just spot or just long-term contracts. You know, entrepreneurs, businesses come up with a mix of contracts. All that was torn up. We basically drove the market to end up where it is now, which is the price of your electricity is determined by the marginal cost of the last gas station on the system. That's not the right price. That's why you're paying too much for your electricity. And that is an inheriting uh, a kind of ultra spot world that the 1990s delivered. So um, I don't think it was going well in the 1990s. I think the investment, uh, the regulation was pretty bad, not as bad as it is now, and not as bad as it is in the water industry now, but pretty bad. And um, the result was the kind of central buyer model we switched. We veered from one model to the other without thinking about how to make competition markets, private sector work uh, in the context of some clear public uh, interest and public 
uh, good goals. So one of your key recommendations from the review was introducing the equivalent firm power auctions. I think if you could explain how that would uh, change from, from the status quo and potentially lead to uh, lower prices for consumers. Um, and also why you think maybe that system wasn't introduced or, or hasn't yet been introduced by the government, just despite your view that's about five years old um, and, and a lot of support from, from analysts. Well, the answer to the second bit about why it wasn't done is pretty straightforward. I mean, the, the lobbyists um, uh, protecting their interests in the current market flocked into bears and basically captured them. Um, and that's still going on in the current uh, REMA review of market structures. You know, if you want to move from an inefficient to a more efficient system, you have to bear in mind who the losers are and how much they'll scream. And basically, the energy industry has become like the farming industry. You know, the NFU's legendary ability to turn uh, government policy to pay polluters to pollute um, is remarkable. But I think when you look across the electricity space, you ain't seen nothing yet. The lobbyists will lobby. So that's the easy bit. OK, now the fundamental questions, which governments, however, can't avoid because the losers are now becoming very apparent. They're customers. They're you and me. And they're screaming. And the government's demand to do something. So now suddenly there's a bit of engagement required. Now, what I was getting at with equivalent firm power is an answer to a central question which ought to have been to, uh, addressed. How do you have security of supply and decarbonize at the same time? Not just how do we do net zero and everything else look after itself, but uh, focus on doing both at the same time. Now, security of supply depends on firm power. You have at any point in time to have enough power stations ready to run pretty much instantaneously to meet whatever the demand is at a point in time. And that requires an excess margin in a world where there isn't much electricity storage. And uh, there's a long time till we're going to have enough electricity storage to solve that problem. And no private market will ever produce deliberately excess supply because it drives prices down uh, from uh, a median mean expected level. Okay, so you have to have public policy intervention to make sure you have that capacity uh, margin. And as a side, that's one of the things that the architects of privatization forgot about in 1990, but then they had lots of spare power stations. So we need firm power, okay? And we need enough of it, and we need to make sure it's there. And I've always wanted it auctioned. So companies bid uh, to provide those services in as a competitive way as they possibly can. So it's a very pro-competition idea. Now, the issue that arises about firm power, about firm power actually being able to deliver what's required at a point in time, is that we have lots of technologies on the system now which have two features. One is they're intermittent. They don't work all the time. In fact, they don't work most of the time. That's crucial. There are very few wind farms that work 50% of the time, for example. Okay? And they're also zero marginal cost, which creates another additional problem. So in a merit order of bidding the marginal cost of your plant, the answer from wind is naught. And indeed, that's why in, in Germany, for example, you've seen negative wholesale prices as wind uh, uh, comes in at naught and people have to uh, bid negative prices to get in the system. So on intermittency, it's true that having wind farms adds security to the system. Right? You're better off having them than not having them, but they're not 100% going to generate, so you need backup supplies. So the question, and again, it's a very pro-market dimension of the cost of energy review, which the lobbyists hate, is that, uh, and you'll see why in a second, the idea is that you can offer some security, but not 100%. So we derate the intermittent generators by the degree of their intermittency to the system. So, for example, a wind farm might be derated to 40%. Okay. So suddenly you're not getting as much money as a baseload power station can deliver. 
Right? That's not good news if you're one of those players. So you want to say to yourself, how do I get my D rating up from, say, 40% to 80%? Well, the answer is straightforward. You cause the intermittency, you go and find in the balancing market or in direct investment, uh, a group of consumers you can get to uh, manage their demand, uh, invest in some backup storage and some batteries, you know, a whole host of things you could do. And that places the incentive to do something about the problem on those who cause it. And then the absolute level of equivalent firm power is the necessary amount that you need to be pretty sure that the lights are going to stay on so you've got enough power. So you can see immediately that it's efficient. Right? It is equivalent firm power you need, as a matter of fact, if you want security supply. It's massively pro-competitive. It places the responsibility where it lies. And for intermittent generators, it's not welcome when they've been able to dump the costs of the intermittency on everyone else in the system and not pay them themselves. So you, if you were an intermittent generator, would lobby like hell to make sure that Helm's proposal never sees the light of day. Hmm. And if you look at the latest REMA document, you'll see that it's tagged in in chapter, I think, 10 in the last two or three pages. And then there's some rather, in my view, sneering and uh, derogatory uh, comments made to dismiss it out of hand. Well. All the other solutions will have to come up with something that delivers equivalent firm power that just be more expensive. And the burden will fall on us, the consumers, and us, the consumers, for not having the efficiency of the auctions. But of course, the generators will gain the benefit. And why wouldn't they campaign for that? Just like the NFU yeah. and the farmers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in a sense moving from a system where you, you pay a wind turbine just when it's producing to saying, I expect you with wind um, turbine company provide a certain amount of energy at all times and you can do that part of the time through your wind turbine but you've got to buy the rest of that energy or, or source the rest of the energy to ensure that security of supply so it effectively changes that the balance from saying uh there's a huge advantage if you can only supply some of the time to saying the expectation is that you are able to work out how to supply all the time um effectively putting a big incentive to, to build up that kind of base low capacity or, or that um surge capacity when you when you don't have renewable, potentially quite beneficial, something like nuclear that, that can produce energy all the time. Though I, what I find quite appealing about your idea is the fact that it is neutral technologically. It, it doesn't yeah. really matter um, whether the energy comes from nuclear or gas or renewables, with probably the exception that you, you've also seen to support a carbon tax to ensure that it's not um, excessively polluting uh, the environment. So um, I, I, I very much, uh, in all the work I've done in energy, have an instinctive hostility to governments picking winners. Uh, as you rightly said at the beginning, and as Off said, losers pick governments. Okay? And lobbying and vested interests ultimately work against the fundamentals, which are us, the consumers, and for whom the market is supposed to deliver. I should just add one other twist to it as well, which is very rarely noted, but explains quite a lot of the vulnerability at the moment of the UK market in pricing terms, which is that if you're intermittent wind, you make everything else intermittent too. So supposing you're a gas station uh, on the system and you want to go and buy some gas, you say, well, you know, look, I know it's really expensive at the moment, but I'd like some gas. You know, you gas company supply it to me. And um, gas company says to you, well, when do you want it? How much do you want? Well, I don't know. Depends when the wind's blowing. If the wind's blowing, I don't want any. But if the wind isn't blowing, I want it. And I want it at the moment the wind stops blowing. That's a big system cost. Now, none of what I'm suggesting says anything other than we should be pursuing uh, net zero and low carbon routes. And the best way, the cheapest way of decarbonizing is to have a polluter pays principle of a carbon price. The problem with it is all those vested interests are going to lose and it's in your face. And remember, the British public has been told, as in a number of other countries, that net zero is free, or it's only going to cost 1% of GDP. And just an aside, that 1% is uh, repeated in a, a government document, and it comes from the Climate Change Committee. They assume no government failure. I mean, how can any official, any 
sensible economist ever come up with a number which assumes the world is the opposite of the one we live in. So once you start to add in government failure, I mean, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if the government could pick the right winners, that they knew exactly what the costs were. We could have a planned economy. There'd be no point in markets, process of market discovery, et cetera. We could abolish all that lot and just have a nice Soviet tractor economy, right? But it's not true. And that's where you have, then have to come out with the reality, which is the customers will find out that it's very expensive to go through this picking winners uh, uh, framework as opposed to a carbon tax and they're going to pay for it and then they're going to scream because they've been told it's not going to cost them anything in net zero and they're discovering is it's really quite expensive and it includes things like that question of making your gas stations intermittent got to be done but you need to confront the reality and not tell uh, porkies I'm not sure it's actually that mysterious about why officials might think that other officials are perfectly capable and and, and never make mistakes. Uh, might be the bias of the trade. But I just want to move on because I think this conversation for a lot of people is potentially quite esoteric considering what, what's happening um, to their, their energy bills. Uh, there's the, the, the fact that we've, we've had an extraordinary increase already uh, in the price of energy and it's expected to skyrocket um, as a result largely of the increase in, in wholesale prices. Um, there have been some quite, I think, extreme calls in response to that, particularly this week, calls to freeze prices, that's what Keir Starmer's called for, or some further to the left in the Labour Party have said they actually need to renationalise all the energy suppliers. What, what do you make of those, those calls and, and what should be a response to the, the current increase in prices? Well, first of all, and, and this reflects back my, my points about a 21st century market, we shouldn't be paying those prices. They're not the sum of the costs of providing the service to you and me. They are charging everything that's delivered to us, or almost everything, at the marginal cost of gas. Right? And that's not right. Okay, So you shouldn't be paying that. Okay? You might not be in a position like France, which has a 4% increase in bills, when 70 or 80% of your electricity in principle comes from nuclear, zero marginal cost, nothing has increased in the cost of nuclear power in France, or not much. The drought's actually done a lot of damage, but that's an aside. Okay. So the first thing to say is, whatever the right answer is, it isn't four or five thousand pounds. It's quite different from that. And what's more, if you think that it's the right answer, then how do you tell the British public that, you know, oh, we ought to invest in nuclear and other stuff because we get out of gas? and therefore get out of these high gas prices. Well, not if the marginal cost is being determined by the price of gas. Okay, So that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that however you look at the current situation, it is extraordinary. And it's almost certainly not going to last. So the oil price is now comfortably below $100. All commodity prices, or almost all commodity prices globally are falling. Look at the copper price as an example. Uh, the gas price is high, but it's high because of what's happened with Russia and the Ukraine. Okay? So I think that this is a shock rather than a permanent change in the price of a fuel. And it's also true that the customers can't pay even if they want to. Now, if you look at average household income and then give them a bill of 5,000 quid a year, and remember that the RPI or the CPI is going to be put in their water bills uh, their train bills and all the other things they're going to front, and remember that the interest rate's going up and therefore the cost of mortgage is rising, it doesn't take a, a mathematical genius to work out people are going to have to not pay some things. Right? And in a civilised society, I think that uh, all citizens should be entitled to reasonable access to uh, water, energy, transport and communications. Uh, these are system uh, public goods, etc. And so I think it's not a question of whether there should be intervention, it's what sort of intervention should take place. I'm quite amenable to the idea that there's a kind of fund uh, in which um, uh, the top's taken off the bills for everybody, and then it's recovered over a period in time going forward. Remember, the original 400 quid loan was going to be in that form. So it's a kind of, you know, buffer where we spread it over a period of time rather than do it immediately. Um, whether the price level to set is no increase from the last increase in the price cap is a, 
a pragmatic judgment to make about how many people are not going to pay or can't pay and how that's going to go forward. Um, I have no real feel for that or expertise on that, but I think that there's a lot to be said for a relatively similar, simple way of going forward. As, as to nationalisation, well, you know, you can take various views about the wonders of public ownership or the brilliance of private ownership. I'm much more pragmatic about this. It's really about having well-regulated businesses. I worry a lot about the extreme financial engineering that's been going on in the distribution companies and the repeated M&A and takeovers uh, and what the balance sheets look like and the state of some of that infrastructure that the private sector has delivered. Storm Arwen bringing down uh, electricity lines suggests to me people weren't trimming their trees, people being cut off for 10 days is remarkable. Uh, not having enough power capacity to link up new house in the west of London tells you that quite a lot of the issues that are arising in the water industry right now have been going on in electricity too. So let's not get carried away and think that private is perfect and public is uh, evil. But I think that the reality comes down to this has been a very badly regulated industry. Uh, it reaches its nadar when we're in a situation in which half the suppliers go bust and you and I have to pay, well, the best part of £200 each just to bail these people out. Uh, no prudent regulation, uh, prudential regulation I can see. And I think we're going to see some really quite, uh, I hope we're not, but I suspect we might see some quite uh, worrying things coming out of the state of the distribution networks as well. Hmm. So, I mean, in terms of takeaway uh, from that, it's, it's number one, address the underlying issues in the market. Uh, num number two, help the households that need to be helped. I mean, I'd probably have a preference for um, cash transfers to the most needy households, because I, I worry that broad-based support um, is, ends up giving a lot of money to people who don't necessarily need it. Um, but maybe that's a, a bit Well, more if, you, a, if you want to go down question. that route... Then, then, and I'm you know, not averse to that at all. You just say, we're just going to look after the socially needy. Um, my take on that is, why don't you invent a social tariff as a block and make it universal? All citizens get a block of power to start with at a lower price. After all, these are all system costs now. They're not marginal costs, right? It's a question of how you spread them across. There's no escape, there's no switching from these costs. Uh, and start to construct on that basis. And I think the same issues come up in water at the moment too. So yes, the problem about means-tested benefits is that uh, um, by dropping everything into that box, we create really quite nasty incentives in respect of work and the functioning of labour markets. And I think we've probably reached the envelope of those, but that's way beyond the electricity system to think elsewhere. But I, I think the upshot of this is there's no perfectly right answer to this, right? Um, what I'm interested in is not ad hoc interventions, but interventions which enable us to move to a 21st century energy market and a 21st century energy structure in which zero marginal costs are the norm, rather than the exception, uh, and make sure that we have security supply in that framework, and not to do short-term things which are going to muck it up. So um, a uh, fund which pays off through time is a practical way where we could get on with the fundamental reforms. Uh, that's one measure. Social tariffs another. But, you know, at the back of all this is, if the government at the time had taken seriously what's in the cost of energy review, you know, they would not be in this mess, right? And the bills would not be of this size or scale. But uh, they've repeatedly, and, you know, there's a perfectly good political economy explanation of this, caved in to relentless lobbying. Um, and um, the result of relentless lobbying, just as it is in the farming sector, is that you and I pay more. In the end, we find out what these bills are. And then um, the public revolts, understandably. So another issue uh, that comes up quite a lot, uh, particularly from those from a market persuasion, it relates to some of the restrictions on planning. Um, and I, I know you've done a lot of work uh, on the natural environment, uh, but at the same time, are there genuine concerns about things like preventing the development of onshore winds, um, fracking, uh, even in the case of water, there, there was also a, a, a case 
um, that's been going on for years in terms of preventing Thames water from um, building a new new basin in in Oxford. It seems like that the planning system and and the way that's designed is quite problematic from the perspective of, of trying to, to build out supply that, that might be necessary that they could provide you with some of that um, grade of energy that's needed. I think when it comes to the planning system, uh, of course, those who would like to get planning permission and don't complain vociferously about it. And um, uh, those who would like to preserve uh, the countryside aspect, aspect complain about it too. The fundamental issue is that we live in a small, incredibly densely populated country in England. It's not true of Wales, it's not true of Scotland, uh, but this is one of the most densely populated, particularly in the South of England, places in the world. Netherlands, Hong Kong, etc. to add to it. And there are contested and competing uses of the land. And some things that the land can deliver aren't priced. Biodiversity isn't priced. Clean air isn't priced, etc. Carbon pollution isn't priced. And some things are. So it's heavily distorted. Uh, and it's densely populated. I prefer an approach which says, look, you need to have a, a take on land use and land use priorities. We don't want people just planting trees anywhere and claiming carbon offsets without thinking about where they fit in catchments. We don't want housing developments are going to produce all sorts of difficulties for water supplies, uh, though they shouldn't create difficulties for electricity supplies. But on the other hand, we do need lots of stuff done. So I think that net zero and the water issues and the housing development issues and the carbon offset stuff and the future of post uh, England and Wales agriculture after Brexit raise a big question as to what is our land use framework within which these decisions are made. Otherwise, we just have ad hoc decisions between incredibly expensive lawyers who work out how to uh, pursue rightly their clients' interests, and then loads of PR companies going around lobbying governments to get particular outcomes. And that seems to me to be quite wrong. So if you want to decarbonize within the next 25 years, if you want to do that, if you want to decarbonize the electricity system within the next 13 years, which would be the greatest transformations that have ever happened in the British economy, much greater than turning a peacetime to a war economy because they're all fossil fuels, right? And the British economy is 80% fossil fuels. It's very important. You want to get rid of that lot, you want to do it in a quarter of a century, and you want to do it partly with sequestration and partly with power systems, and you want to sort out your water industry. Then, as sure as hell, a pitch battle by battle location by location way of going about land use does not strike me as being good for natural capital, good for net zero, good for development, or good for farming. But it's very good for lobbyists. Well, it's, it's very good for lobbyists and, and I think can also encourage a, a tendency to, to say, not in my backyard, uh, rather than thinking about the broader picture. And, well, and also in reverse to so that can, can lead to overdevelopment in certain places. It can lead but, to very bad decision making. But the the, the NIMBY bit is easy to dismiss. But, you know, in a civilised society, don't you want people to ca care about their locality, right? And when you come to the incremental stuff, take the Green Belt, right? It's true, the Green Belt is not what people think it is, but it could be. It's exactly where you want natural capital to be, near to people to use it. And the trouble with the incremental stuff, I'll give you an example. Um, if you go to St. James's Park in London, in central London, and a tycoon comes along and says, just give me a little bit of corner to build a house on, because I've been the only person with a house on uh, St. James's Park. I'll give you enough money to build four hospitals in London. Right? Then I suspect people say, well, you know, the hospital's much better than we do. Most of the park's still there. It's only a little corner gone. Right? Then you take the next bit. Then you take the next bit. And this incremental salami cutting of system natural capital is a huge mistake. 
And the way to approach this is to look at the systems of natural capital and make sure that land use planning works around those systems. Catchments, green belts, lungs for city, woodland corridors, as well as physical bricks and mortar, capital, etc. We need both, but uh, they are always going to be contested and we need a proper, efficient way of going about this, not salami cuts. Well, I better leave it there. Thank you very much for what has been, I think, quite a fascinating and broad discussion. Uh, Dieter Helm from Professor of Economics at the University of Oxford and an energy expert. Hope to speak again soon. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.